Bueno, buenos días con todos. Bienvenidos a este Good curso. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this short course entitled El Niño in the Americas, Protecting Health and Promoting Resilience. This is session number three on the on water quality and security. As you know, this course is a cooperation between uh, PAHO, the GCCHE, the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, the World Meteorological Organization, and the UNDRR. Next, please. Today, I will be your moderator. I am Suhelen Padilla. I am a, I have an, a PhD in atmospheric physical chemistry. I am a member of the Health and Climate Change Group at the Pan American Health Organization. I'm part of the STEP program at the Inter American uh, Institute for um, uh, Global uh, Change Research. Next, please. Well, first of all, I would like to welcome everyone to this course. I would like to uh, give you now some instructions. At the bottom of the screen, you have the interpretation settings. We have live simultaneous interpretation, and you can find it that at the bottom of the screen on your Zoom screen. Uh, and I think it's already working. Next, please. As I was saying, this is session number three, and we will be addressing water quality and security in the Americas. We will have two panelists with us here today. I will be introducing them shortly. As you know, in the uh, next session, we will be addressing the other topics for this course. Next, please. These are 90 minute sessions. At the end of the sessions, we have a Q&A section. These sessions are recorded and will be posted on our website within 24 hours. Reference materials will also be uh, uploaded to the website. We'll be sharing the links on this chat so that you have the information and you can follow the course. Next, please. As I was saying, the presentation slide decks are available on, on the course website. You can download them within 24 hours. So please feel free to go to your website and download the materials. In the meantime, um, in the chat, we will be including the recommendations uh, prepared with PAHO regarding the short term recommendations for this session. Next, please. As I was saying, we will be pasting the short-term recommendations in the chat. They will be, they are in English and Spanish. Haley will be sharing this material in the chat. And you can have a look at it again on the website because all the material will be available there and you'll be able to download it from our website. Next, please. So first of all, I would like to include our panelists. First of all, thank you for being here in today's session, session number three. First of all, we have Patricia Rodesno de Segurado. She's a professional, has a master's degree in health engineering. She has over 35 years of experience in public health. She was, uh, she led the National Environmental Health Division in El Salvador. She joined PAHO in the Plac Salud program as an international advisor. She worked there between 2001 and 2023. She, she also heads the uh, advisor, advisory office in health and environment in countries such as Colombia, Paraguay, Honduras, and Mexico. Our second panelist, Salvador Ayala Pizarro, he's a geographer. He has a master's degree in uh, public health uh, awarded by the uh, University of Chile. He's a uh, management inform an information management professional at the Institute of Public Health of Chile, and he coordinates a climate and health division within the institution. Thank you both for being here uh, today. Um, thank you for your presentations as well. And let's begin with our first panelist. Next, please. Thank you. 
Thank you and good morning, everyone. First of all, let me uh, open the presentations. Can you see the screen there? Thank you so much to the organizers of this event for inviting me to participate. Uh, I would like to share this analysis and, analysis and reflection with you regarding water and sanitation in the region and also which tools we have to address the various components when it has, comes to responding to an emergency and also the daily um, aspects regarding how to improve uh, how to improve water quality and access to water in every country. I think you have already seen this in the, the other training uh, courses. But I would like to uh, say two important things. First of all, September was the, the hottest month we've had. I think our co-presenter will be providing more statistics in this regard. There was an uh, a 0.7 increase on average, and that entails um, quite a high degree of change. Uh, the WHO has determined that some countries are at higher risk. In red, we can find these countries, Colombia, El Salvador, Guatemala, Guyana, Honduras, Nicaragua, Peru. In the, in the latest Nino, I was in Honduras. In Honduras, we had a terrible drought. It was throughout Central America, as a matter of fact. But I was there at the time, and I, 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 there were terrible harvest losses. There was also an increased number of deaths, and also um, the pine trees were destroyed by a pest and a lot of trees uh, were destroyed and forests in Honduras. There was also a reduction in water volume and some water sources that uh, tended to disappear. This led to the creation of an emergency uh, program to deal with this drought. Uh, maybe El Mich and other issues and our experience with all of this meant that now our coordinated work is better because we can create different panels that address the different topics. Uh, we worked on water and sanitation and nutrition as well. Of course, we can also think about the situation in other countries. But let's go uh, to our region. Our, our region is greatly affected by several emergencies. 681 droughts, 400 storms, 92 earthquakes, 78 landslides, 77 droughts. Um, when we watch the news and we compile this year's events, we can see, for instance, in California, there are droughts and floods at the same time. Um, in Canada as well, with the uh, forest fires that went uh, beyond the Atlantic. Uh, and this uh, also drives our attention to what is happening in Brazil. Therefore, the problem is increasing. Therefore, we need to be ready and we need to assess our level of preparedness in the, for the process. Uh, but let's see how this affects the health sector. We have increased rainfall. We also have storms. Storms are now stronger, faster. We have higher volume, water volumes. Also, there are increased droughts in other areas and also forest fires. All of these affects health. Uh, vector uh, borne diseases increase, for instance. In Honduras, remember I was telling you about this example, there was an increase, uh, droughts are, are slower in a way 
And also when we have droughts, for instance, water is not sco uh, stored correctly. And when this happens, you know, there is water that is uncovered and we have vectors, dengue, Zika, Chikungunya, and we have the vectors at home. Also, when there are droughts, uh, we might have uh, contamination issues and water quality issues as well. These elements go hand in hand because this also causes a lack of proper nutrition. Therefore, we need to integrate these components in order to be ready to face each of these stages according to the area. And we also need to make the best possible use of scientific information. Um, these are some of the most critical components, among them malnutrition. Clearly, malnutri malnutrition uh, is connected to diseases, for instance, cholera, which might increase, or uh, diarrhea. The, some other diseases are now becoming high-risk diseases, such as malaria, uh, followed by virosis, and well, these, uh, uh, the incidence of these diseases is increasing. Why is water and sanitation important? Big, and why does this affect uh, well-being in general? We would like to see a reduction in child disease. We would like to have more children survive. We, sh we should have better health services, better food security and less diarrheal diseases, uh, less parasite incidents, higher nutrition levels, decent work. And this is what we want to have. This is our dream. Um, but reality is different. And nowadays, we have high mortality, uh, childhood mortality rates in our region, also uh, hospital infections, parasite diseases. And, and this is normal, let's say. We do run uh, these programs, uh, school programs, in order to um, address the issues. And they are a prevention uh, measure. But we could also take uh, other types of action in order to prevent parasites from entering our food and our environmental quality processes. We need to reduce diarrheal diseases as well and reduce pollution and contamination if we do things properly. The WHO has issued a document for health practitioners that includes important data about infectious diseases. And this is related to this pressure. We have climate change. We have high and quick urbanization levels. Central America is one of the high, uh, the most highly urbanized regions in the world. It's also one of the most unequal regions in the world. And this increased population does impact the increase of every disease. We also have infectious diseases that uh, lead to terrible risks, such as childhood mortality, diarrhea, tropical diseases, other diseases we do not pay attention to, sepsis in hospitals. And there, there are also um, uh, chemical related risks when it comes to fresh water. Water already might have fluoride or arsenic that might be beneficial in small doses, but it might be negative in larger doses. So that might be really something we need to consider when it comes to water contaminants. There are other aspects such as pesticides and, and the intensive use of pesticides in the region. And that might not have a short-term impact, but it, the impact does show over time because it affects people's health in the long run. So we need to address these elements to know what's happening with these elements in our water. And as I was saying, this clearly impacts people's well-being, economic development, 
and also on the uh, uh, security and peace uh, in the region. There are already water-related conflicts in some regions, such as was the case in, in some cities where we've had a drought, so lower water volumes, and that, for instance, Uruguay had several problems in this regard, which was a very serious issue. Also regarding antimicrobial resistance, uh, disease control and prevention. Water and sanitation are always part of these topics. If we keep the, the UN dream alive, universal access to water and sanitation, if we achieve that, we can reduce the use of antibiotics and we can um, then have uh, fewer diarrheal diseases and shorten treatments. Also, prophyl the prophylactic use of antibiotics in deliveries, which is already happening in several countries. Uh, this is 90% of women uh, around the world, people who, the, the women who deliver babies um, do receive these antibiotics. Also, we need to consider other neonatal deaths related to sepsis, and we should think about uh, wastewater and the spread of resistant bacteria and genes. So we need to consider all of this. We need to remember also what's happening in our hospitals. We have deaths that can be attributed to poor quality care. 50% uh, of patients get infected during a hospital stay, also neonatal deaths and maternal mortality. We studied the situation of hygiene, water and sanitation based on the uh, WHO indicators. Why? Because these indicators are being monitored for uh, the fulfillment of SDGs. In health facilities, we found that 82% get water, but con continuity of servity uh, goes down to 72%, um, uh, uh, but the issue is the quality of water that reaches these health, health facilities and how we monitor this quality, how we can actually show that water reaches the facility as it should. And that figure goes down to 53.6% in this case. These are the data for just one indicator, but many other indicators are monitored, uh, water, waste, sanitation. And we need more information about these indicators. If there is no information available regarding the basic water and sanitation conditions in our hospitals, then it will be very difficult to make a real change and, and to, to improve our situation. And this has uh, made the, our authorities worried as well, because they issued a resolution regarding patient safety, also how to improve water and sanitation conditions, and that's one of the targets of our countries. And it is, it's included in a global target as well. And the topic is also addressed by the steering committees. Having safe water and sanitation is a key element to improve the uh, conditions in our health facilities. These are some basic indicators that are truly basic. Later on, in the when we address the housing conditions, we will see how we monitor these indicators. Water needs to be available from an improved source. That's a basic condition. Regarding sanitation, we should have a facility for women, another one for men within the main facilities, and they should be working properly. Hygiene. Before the COVID, when we compiled this data, we considered this component. Um, there were hygiene facilities, but no soap. Therefore, uh, this was a major indicator. People should have water and soap in order for people to be able to wash their hands.
is another issue that we also evaluated. So these are the indicators. And this is what we see that come out in the SDGs. So here we talk about having sustainable um, availability of water, sustainable management and um, sanitation for everyone, and also for the population to ensure that they have this water. So what does it mean to safely manage water? And so this is where um, we saw that we see it, that indicators were changed. So generally speaking, people um, end up getting a basic sanitation. So they don't have um, the sources that are taken. They're not protected. They need to ha have to bring in their own water up to having uh, water that's coming out of the tap. But this has to be managed safely. And that's a totally different level. And so that's what we need to start working towards. So it's something that's continuous, that it's quality, and this is where we start seeing the sort of problems that come across. Um, these are the values I wanted to show you. So what we're looking for is global monitoring, which is not a specific monitoring. It has to be priority and with the different, um, we need to be serving schools especially, but what's happening here? So what we see that's happening is that people who have um, safe, managed water is only 80% of the population. Sounds good, but we're going to see that this amount is not growing over time to get to the goal and that the people who need um, sanitation services is really critical. So we see 49.2% of people are connected to effective uh, treatment of um, wastewater. And so we're concerned about getting water, but we're not getting concerned about treating that wastewater. And so this is a critical issue that we have to face. So here we can see in um, this chart how this has been developed over time. So since 2010, this growth has not changed to improve water services in a safe way. So here we have two guidelines, which is the guideline um, for water quality and also the sanitation. Um, guideline. So the one for water has been updated over time, but it goes from 95, 95 when it came out. It's been updated with different versions, different editions, and every day um, to see the new technologies that are coming into play. The guidelines um, for sanitation, this is something that came out more recently in 2019 and has been um, promoting the d development of this. Um, these guidelines have been have been promoted. But why are we looking at all these different components? Because we're looking for ways to make improvements to have um, water safety um, plans. And so what we're going to see here, what exactly do these plans mean? And these plans, we can see that there's other ones also that are related to um, san sanitation um, security plans, which are also coming at these. All of these plans have been um, have been improved over time. And so now we have been um, including these two to see how the, the weather, the climate can influence um, planning for water. And so this is um, from a disaster viewpoint. We're now focused on prevention to find out what are the vulnerabilities that we have, evaluate risks and set up an emergency plan and develop in um, the training plans that we need. We also have the issue that has to do with um, different interventions, evaluation of what the damages are. And then if we see, if we work on the um, what happens beforehand, we need to see what kind of specific tools can be used. And this is where we have the different regulations that are come in and how these can provide support to see how they can be deployed in all of our different um, countries and have the right kind of response so that the systems are working um, adequately. So if we look at um, the conceptual framework of water security, as we can see in the guidelines, it focuses on a context that has to do with protecting people's health. All the different objectives of security, water is a public um, health um, key point. So here we can see that we have water institutions, but we also need in certain countries, we need um, you know, the, the regulator is actually the health authority because water is really important for public health. 
So here we can see how these different um, water safety plans can be developed. And we've got an entire analysis of the system and they established what are the different control measures and what are the planning and management measures. And so at the same time, we're also trying to get an oversight system that's independent because obviously when um, the water is produced, it needs also to be controlled. And so that's the control that people are putting in. But um, it also needs to ensure that the information that's coming and that there's a safety plan and that we have um, analysis within the network to see what exactly is the situation that's happening so that they can take public health actions within the community. And so that's why it's really important for health to be in all of the different components when it comes to water and sanitation. And so we can say that water should be um, in the right, uh, the, the, should be have the right quality for um, personal use and hygiene. And so what are the different indicators that we need to look at right now? One is coverage. That was something that was evaluated in, um, here we could see that we wanted to have a, what, what kind of coverage would the water networks have and so here in this SDG, we're really focused on human rights and we talk about the continuity of service. And so this is where we find countries or cities. For example, in Honduras, Honduras, um, we're in Tegucigalpa, where we could see public works and um, sometimes where people would have a service for five or six hours and so people who have more resources do have uh, tanks and they've got uh, water cisterns, but poor people do not. And so these are people who need to store their water in any sort of um, container. And so we have to see how we can improve the continuity of services. And so in some areas, people will say, well, I've got you know the water network, but I don't actually have any water. And so this is one very important indicator. And obviously something that's very important to public health is quality. What's the water quality? And, you know, what kind of chemical, uh, bacteriological, and how are we going to add um, water quality controls in the country? How is that being monitored in um, the different systems? And in some countries, we could see that they don't have or, or they've had certain um, surveillance systems have been um, dismantled. So here we're looking at what kind, what is the situation going on right now with um, the independent surveillance of services? So we also have this um, glass assessment which looks at all of the water management. And so here we can see a component that has to do with surveillance. There's two different countries here that um, have an institution that's an external um, institution that um, makes these analyses. So here, if we look at the different colors, we see the ones that um, they don't realize, they don't do it, it's inefficient or it's insufficient or um, they're done, but they don't use data, they're done and it's using the basis for planning and for taking action. Two countries that have all of the, the points in rural and urban areas where all of these measurements are done, which was Colombia and Cuba. So in Colombia, I was um, living in Colombia for a while and in Colombia, they work a lot um, with a comprehensive work between the healthcare sector, the, um, the regulator sector, and certain um, providers, service providers, but how the information and that comes from the surveillance about water quality, how that is automatically um, sent to the regulator, so that um, that can go into the to the health um, re, um, the health authority, so they can actually take actions. And so, how do these results from the surveillance? Um, how are they included in all of our different risk analyses? And this is where we see that it's really important to see in emergency institutions, what's going on with the surveillance system when we're talking about water quality. How are these um, health inspectors um, really um, taking a more relevant role in um, checking this information? And this is where it becomes really important for the, for, um, for the higher levels to really take actions um, to see how they can improve water quality. So what is it that we see when we look into the different security plans? So we used to think about uh, monitoring um, what are the different points, the common points, the critical points, the, the farthest away point. And yeah, those things are important. 
but also um, it, a lot of it has to do with um, health a sanitation inspection. What are the critical points? What are the risks at these different critical points? And um, not just working here on within the system, but rather also working within the water basin, because in the water basin is where we see a lot of critical issues. And this is when we have all of these extreme um, emergencies that we're seeing. We find that um, we see a lot of, you know, where, where the water goes to go, it goes through, um, and, you know, there, there's a breakage in the in the different pipes and there's lots of different risks and risks that can happen when we've got, you know, deforestation or risks that could happen that are related to, um, you know, climate related events. And so all of this affects the system. So I was in a, ta in a, in a conference in the United States, I think, if I remember correctly, in Missouri. And what they had done was analyze that they could have um, a certain maximum amount in, in one in, in, in within a year. And so they had, um, you know, protection measures because of floods that could happen. And the year that that, that was in question, you know, they didn't have that maximum measure. And so we had all this and then there was no maximum measure, but the next year there was. And so if they hadn't made those investments the previous year, they would have had problems um, in all their cities. And so we see how these different prevention measures that are taken and the use of information um, that as we're gonna see um, further ahead really do help to make a risk analysis and to take the control measures um, that are needed in the different systems and to plan, to plan in order to be able to control the conditions of the different systems and also to be able to, um, to be ready with a response. So we make a lot of efforts to improve water quality. And so then we um, we come there, you know, with our glass and we drink the water. But in the end, what we end up doing is uh, discharging into our, or, you know, dumping it out in our in our toilets. And we don't really know what happens in the cities. Do they, does it go into the groundwater? Does it go into our food? Is it used for irrigation? Um, and if it does it go into different water bodies where there's high concentrations of, of problems? I mean, this is a risk. And it also goes into water treatment plants and downstream. And so we're going to see that and in some uh, some cities in Colombia where we saw that some of these water treatment plants had a certain level of quality and the, and the, and the river had really high concentrations of microbes. And so then here we have our... Um, Samples of what is exactly that happens in water systems, different damages because of hurricanes in the different facilities, um, to pipe breakages, distribution problems, um, floods, um, changes in the water basin and the water course. And then we see the population. So the population comes in. And how do we distribute that water? What are the distribution conditions looking like? What kind of, um, you know, the system, it, when there's a cut that happens and we have to do a distribution and there's some sort of, you know, how do we, how do we plan all of this? It's the same thing when there's a drought. So even though this might be like a slow situation, we can have um, lower water levels and, and at, the, at the water capture centers, and we have a with lower amounts because they don't have enough um, you, you don't have enough capacity and um, they don't have enough water until the next rain. Um, we've got issues when it comes to um, supply. In certain cities, I think it was in Bolivia where they had a big uh, drought problem. And so they had um, water tanker trucks and they had all kinds of water tankers. But even in that case, you have to make sure that for example, these tanker trucks haven't been um, loading oil in other situations where they have some sort of contaminant or pollutant. And so there needs to be rules. And so that's why we're setting up guidelines when it comes to um, water distribution. And in the different links, you're gonna find all of this information when we talk about emergencies, because there can be many different risks in um, certain areas, for example, in, in Mish, um, there was there were damages in the whole um, coast of, of my country where they, we saw all the water wells 
Um, they had to clean them. They had latrines that would collapse. And so um, they were they were cleaned and then they continued working. But there are many different, um, you know, guidelines, which I will show you. And so those might be helpful to you. And those are going to be at the end in the presentation. And so here, obviously, we're going to continue analyzing um, vulnerabilities. And we can see that those vulnerabilities could be physical or, or organizational or operational. And so we can really make um, better response plans when it comes to emergencies and to take on disasters. And so that um, when, it, when there is an emergency, I mean, who do we call? Who's responsible? Have there been resources assigned for that emergency? In the uh, Mexico earthquake, there were um, there were evaluations, there were different criteria, and they started to have specific um, resources to um, enable the different systems. And we also have to further strengthen um, the health sector with other sectors so that we can have we can be more responsive. And so if we really do want to improve mitigation, then we need to have this prevention system and to see what are um, the different systems that are available in the countries. And like I said, there are several that has to do with an emergency response that some have their, within their, their regulations have the obligation. So I'm gonna give you an example, like in Colombia, in the quality guideline, they asked for the systems to have their own emergency plan. And so what this avoids is to see in these um, plans, what would be the priority points that we have, um, which should be a priority point in um, this um, water provision um, to so what's going to happen if, if the water's not reaching the different um, the different places where they need to arrive? So there needs to be these connections to know what are the different um, catastrophes, the entire system that's been organized, you know, how many vehicles do we have available? What are the control measures? What are the, what are the costs? And in the end, then we see what is the um, the program that we have here to evaluate. So when it comes to public health, um, I would also want to discuss um, the risks that we have in public health when we talk about water that's provided in public systems. This is really important. And here it's important for us to have data from our health sector to see when we say, okay, so in our establishment, there's gotta be some um, point of comparison to be say, you know, what's the situation that's going on with water in our different um, establishments? What are the situation in, in the communities to um, apply the corrective measure, measures that might be necessary and to have this surveillance system when we talk about water quality, which is going to be related to public health. So what happens with um, healthcare technicians or um, engineers um, that work with health in the different countries, they have to look at all the different activities, all of the risks that are related to, you know, shelters, supply, you know, with regulators, with um, more supply matters, um, what are they doing with um, storage, whether these plants actually are working, if they're not working. And so these are all preventative measures that are used for verification to verify whether the quality is there, if there's sufficient qualities in each one of the different components of the system, um, to have notifications to be made to the regulator or to the working group to see what the situation is and what's going on with the different components and to see if there is water and what is the quality of the water that's coming into the different shelters to see that you've got enough um, in storage, if there is hygiene. So for example, what are the different messages that we should have for um, when there's a drought? And I remember when there was an emergency in um, the earthquakes and they would say, okay, so we need a messages that are related to water and earthquakes and what is it that we can do? And in the end, 
they were saying, well, these are the different key messages that we have. These are the actions that we have. And all of that has to be really well defined, written out, because when it comes time and the emergency happens, it can cause problems. Messages for the community. These are key uh, messages. We need to have them ready beforehand so that we can uh, then adapt the information. Also, I would like to tell you that we have tools uh, in our organization. I think the best no one in the area of uh, disaster, disasters has to do with uh, hospitals uh, and security as well. We also have tools and documents which allow us to develop water security plans. And also we they help us work with sanitation programs. We have organized training courses in order to include these components throughout the region. We have involved, we have engaged the environmental sector, regulators, suppliers that can do this work and also to take some preventive action and to raise people's awareness. We have also worked in health facilities uh, with WHO indicators. Uh, we have worked with basic indicators and also more advanced indicators that focus on uh, climate resilience in health facilities. And we also have the Wash, spread, wash press course. This is another tool that we have. This tool focuses on the necessary inputs or actions when it comes to addressing uh, an emergency or disaster. We also have the cleaning and disinfection course uh, in hospitals. As I was saying, there is also a protocol that includes these indicators. They have to do with the WASH uh, program, the course programs. We also have a protocol that includes information about, uh, to improve the information we have about our health facilities. This will allow us to be better prepared in order to respond uh, to an emergency or disaster. This is a literature I have used. Here you can find uh, more data and information regarding water and sanitation. Here I have also pasted some links to the security courses, drinking water, and also uh, guides that help us uh, respond in the case of emergencies or disasters. And there are also some technical technical notes on water that, that I think are interesting and are basic when it comes to working on the field. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your participation. And hopefully the information I have provided today will be useful to every speaker and participant in this meeting. And please uh, disseminate these tools as academics, um, disseminate, disseminate these connections between research, improving water quality, also uh, the condition of surveillance systems and how we can improve this connection uh, from analyzing the water quality data and the data we have on diseases. This is one of the uh, aspects that needs to be improved regarding uh, water security. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Gracias, Patricia. Thank you, Patricia. So, um, there we go. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, presentation very interesting, a lot of information as well. Um, data quality remains very important. Um, and this also has to do with public health because water security is a, a public health issue. And it reminds us, reminds us that it's an issue in the region. Air quality is also important. And we need to remember that uh, communication ne needs to be effective as well. 
I believe that these tools will be very useful to every participant in this meeting. We'll be able to use some information. Thank you for sharing all this information and for your presentation, of course. Um, the questions we will address at the end of the meeting. Now I would like to give the floor to our next panelist. Salvador, you have the floor. Thank you, Zuelen. Let me share my screen. Perfect. Bueno, para comenzar también agradecer a la a la doctora Patricia Segurado y su presentación porque la presentación que yo First of all, thank you to my colleague. Uh, because my presentation also has to do with water quality and sanitation. But it has to do with uh, data quality as well. So hopefully you, you'll find it useful. Um, health and climate. It's a broad topic that includes El Nino as well. So through the Public Health Institute, we are presenting an adaptation and a measure that aims to um, improve this condition. I know that we have seen this uh, type of chart many times regarding climate change, but you will see in a minute why, why I'm using it now. Um, when we uh, talk about climate change, we have the IPCC, an, an intergovernmental uh, organization. In the sixth report uh, in 2020, they forecast this future temperature scenario from a pessimistic to an optimistic scenario. Why do we address this? How can we address this? Uh, regarding global public policies and uh, state policy, we're always trying to get countries to control uh, temperature increase and to to keep it below 1.5 increase. Um, uh, but this increase change has different impacts because adaptation will vary according to the country and this temperature modification will have an impact on people's health how you have seen this in many ways uh, an increase in infectious diseases also the development of some, of some pathogens it, it changes people's behavior etc what's the situation in chile these are the 2021 data according to a 2021 report. Well, but broadly, what's the situation in Chile? Countrywide, uh, we can see that uh, since 1960 and onwards, maximum temperatures have been increasing. And this is reflected on um, the chart that you can see at the bottom on the left. Uh, uh, these are the anomalies until 2021, we'd had 11 warmer years, okay? Temperatures are increasing every year. On the right, you can see the evolution of annual precipitation levels. In this case, in Chile, uh, every year is drier. We've had a, a, a rainfall deficit for 15 years now nationwide. However, this year in 2023, the 2023 reports are not out yet, so I don't have a chart. But we're suffering El Nino right now. And like other countries in the region that have droughts, Chile did have rains this year. And that rain helped us a lot because 2023 is now considered a normal year regarding rainfall levels. Uh, before in our country with El Nino, we had a lot of rain, excessive rain, actually. But this year, we are hitting the, the, the regular levels for our country. And we are exceeding that figure slightly. However, what happened? We had better precipitation levels, but for, uh, rainfall is different. We have higher temperatures, and this had a a serious impact on health and disasters as well. Why? Well, our country is very close to the Andes range, which is our border with Argentina, and we have a lot of snow. But as we have El Nino with higher temperatures and rains, we didn't have any snowfall. We had a lot of rain, lots of floods that 
caused major problems and it affected hundreds of thousands of people. What will happen in the summer? Because usually in Chile, it rains in the winter. But what can we forecast for summer? Temperatures are expected to be higher than those forecasted because of El Nino. How can we address these issues? These issues will ha will cause problems regarding temperature, temperature differences, regarding humidity, precipitation, etc. This is a theoretical framework. There are several theoretical frameworks regarding how we can address climate change or climate and health. But this is the one I like. I, I usually share this one be because it can be easily disseminated it's, and it's easy to understand. And hopefully it's, it's easy to see how we can implement an adaptation action. So three main pillars. Uh, these are the uh, effects of climate change. They can be classified into direct, such as storms, floods, droughts, uh, heat waves, etc. Okay, they affect health directly, but we can also have indirect effects through water quality, which is very important, as Dr. Patricia said. A flood causes problems with the, with the quality of water, a, a drought, has the same effect and also regarding land use change and that and these direct and indirect effects will have an impact on people however this impact differs according to the type of population because because there are different types of vulnerability uh, because vulnerability and the capacity to adapt varies within a country so we have the third pillar social dynamics age gender and also socioeconomic status um, and if this allows people to adapt more efficiently so if we see that this has an impact on health we can uh, implement some, some sort of action from our institutions to decrease this impact so that it doesn't affect people so much Given this situation, this year a very interesting article was published regarding the three major challenges. It's very interesting because because I think they were able to uh, summarize all this uh, by uh, uh, including three major challenges in the area of health. Number one, promote actions that reduce carbon emissions and improve health outcomes. For instance, uh, less contamination and that um, creates co-benefits for the population in general. Number two, they talk about being able to build better, more climate resilient, low carbon health systems. Number three, they talk about the capacity to implement public health actions to protect people against climate related health risks. And this challenge, number three, is important. By focusing on three major areas, there are others, but, but it's usually better to work with um, broader areas in order to have better results. Number one, and this is a major challenge, uh, having uh, making data uh, clearly seen and available. The previous presentation uh, talked about the importance of, of data quality. Um, data actually public institutions should have to share data the data must be quality data but they should also be available to everyone that needs the data it's an active transparency measure so that's our goal we should be able to visualize data and also to share the data with the community number two we should promote research and number three, we should be able to organize training courses and disseminate information about the same, this topic. So the first challenge, data visualization and availability. We uh, suggested that a tool be created. It hasn't been launched yet, but it's almost ready. The idea was to create a visualizing platform that, that would be a basic tool. It is a basic tool. It, it just entails collecting health and climate data. But in practice, it's quite complex. Why? First of all, because we need to coordinate 
different areas or institutions need to coordinate their areas, which is already a complex thing to do. And also it creates connections and different types of collaborative uh, efforts with other institutions. We work with the Meteorological Agency in Chile, and they agree to provide all their data regarding temperature, humidity, and rainfall um, events. And then we contribute the Public Health Institute data. And we also aim to include other types of data on mobility. mobility. We uh, grouped people in three large three large groups. Number one, um, foodborne and uh, diseases and and water quality. Number two, vectors and three airborne diseases, or disease or 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 vectors that cause respiratory issues. In the case of water, we have two pilot uh, projects: one on salmonella. When we create, for instance, when we select Tiela we visualize its behaviors um, since 2010 for instance we see how incre it increases or in which months of the year this infection increases and how it works with uh, the mean temperature the maximum temperature and the minimum temperature and we can do the same thing with precipitation and relative humidity and this can be downloaded you can download the the data chart and all in order to conduct further studies. It also allows us to summarize information. This was taken from, uh, we actually worked with a tool to select three regions in Chile. Chile has 16 regions. So here I uh, worked with the first uh, three regions, uh, Antofagasta, Tarapacá, and Parinacota. And each uh, here area shows me the mean temperature. And in black, I can see the number of cases. So I can easily see how the number of cases uh, increases according to temperature. And these data can be downloaded as well. This has to do with visualization, as I was saying. That was stage number one. Stage number two, research. We also worked with work with this platform in order to promote its use and to promote research. And we selected a pilot program. First of all, we have the context. These are the WHO's estimations for 2030, 2050. And uh, this is taken from the uh, WHO's official website. They estimated that for that period, we would have 250,000 uh, deaths or additional deaths because of climate change or unnecessary deaths. And one of the major groups affected would be older people. And also uh, regarding diarrheal diseases, they say that of those deaths, 48,000 will be on account of diarrheic diseases. Uh, diarrhea worldwide uh, leads to uh, the death of 500,000, 25,000 children under five. They are a vulnerable group, and this is the second leading uh, cause of death in this group. And what's the main takeaway message? And this was also mentioned by Patricia, the importance of water and sanitation. Why? Because diarrhea can be fully prevented if we can access uh, if we can guarantee access to water, uh, quality water and sanitation. This means that institutions are much more interested in all of this because they, they can prevent many deaths. So that's a context. We're now studying Shigella. And this is a bacteria that causes dysenteria. Also, it, its minimum growth temperature ranges between six and eight de degrees, maximum temperature 45, 47 degrees. It affects uh, low income people, especially children. And globally, it, it is considered that it is sensitive to climate variation. So in Chile, we noticed that temperature has increased. Um, how will this affect all of this, especially regarding the El Nino phenomenon this year. International evidence is showing us that in the case of Shingila and Basilar dysenteria, 
they have been affected by temperature and cases have been have increased between 19%, 14.8%, 13%. Uh, it's actually, uh, the, the, the percentages are varied, but most studies say that there are now more cases because of higher temperatures. From China? Of, um, literature that's come out of there. So we can look here how this is um, happens in Chile. So we took a study where we saw the northern part, the central part of Chile, as you can see here, how Chile is um, divided up administratively. And you can see that in different regions, which is the region specifically the one, the region that's up towards Peru and Bolivia in the north, here we can see that we have the capital region which has basically half of Chile's population and we also have all of the information from the Meteorological Institute and everything that has to do with everything that comes um, in. And so we did a statistical analysis to see how um, this affected um, our data. And so here we can see, starting from 2010 to 2019, which was before the pandemic, um, because as obviously you can see that all the different agents were um, working in a different were, were, were behaving in a different way. And you can see a higher frequency in the summer. And then after that, there was a decrease that was considerable during the winter months. And so if we really focus 50%, 40% of the, of the um, cases in Chile were with children that were under 10 years of age who are a very vulnerable um, population and with the most of these cases are in the high north, or the extreme northern part of Chile. Um, and so you can see, especially in those um, administrative divisions. Here, to see what is um, the behavior, we can see that in that very northern section, especially by Antofagasta, this is the part where we see that we had an increase in the number of cases um, in, in a considerable amount as compared to the rest of the regions, especially we saw rates that were 78 cases per 100,000, both in Tarapacá and um, 44 out of um, 100,000 in um, Parinacota. So as we can see here, after what was the behavior related to the um, temperatures, you can see here that the high, the extreme north area, which is Arinica and Parinacota, Tarapacá and Antofagasta, when there was more temperature, there were more cases, especially in the metropolitan area, but this was um, to a lesser extent. So we're seeing the the, min the minimum, the, mi the median, and the maximum temperature. When we see relative uh, temperatures, we can see that we have um, confusing results because of the measurements that were made because these are coastal regions and because of you know specificities to the different um, cities. And also then here in this area, we didn't see any relationship um, related to the fact that in the um, uh, the extreme north of Chile, you have only like one or two millimeters of rain in the year. And so that doesn't really make much of a difference. So to be able to confirm this, we also applied a statistical method, um, which um, we had with a random effect. But as you, you can see that what we found and we took into account the regions and also the years throughout the period to see how the temperature would um, have an effect on the number of cases and we could observe how for each degree that the temperature increased on average per month, the maximum um, temperature, um, it was 13%, which is quite coherent with what we had seen in other articles relating to international evidence, which also was between 13, 15 or 20%. Despite this, um, if these are exploratory data and um, we, we now looked at it, we can see that we need to look at other types of components, um, which had to do with, um, you know, socioeconomic region, um, stratum or, or other similar issues. So this year, which is an El Nino year, we can see that this has been observed because we have uh, forecasted an increase in temperature beyond what is normal because of the El Nino phenomenon. And then finally, just to start um, finishing up this example and this discussion, I think that we still, and this is just a pilot program, so we still need to include new agents to be able to view and um, distribute data. Also, we need to develop um, ongoing surveillance when it talks about health to be able to generate um, a monitor, to monitor the impact of um, climate, 
And so we need information to be able to make um, some comparisons in the future. So if we'd had, for example, in this case, you know, ongoing monitoring from a certain agent over a long period of time, then we would, and now that we have the El Nino phenomenon, we could have been uh, monitoring what exactly is um, the behavior over time to be able to take some sort of action and to um, make preventative measures. And so we need to work between public institutions and within public um, institutions and um, between different academic institutions and also the community. And despite the fact that awards are very um, simple, to generate um, this collaborative work, it's, it's complicated. And so we have to start doing this to make um, the greatest adaptation to protect our population. We also need um, to foster develop in this sort of um, research to see what we can do to have a better adaptation measures. And then finally, just um, to kind of, um, I wanted to show you this, um, this image that I had um, when the whole pandemic started, I thought that the pandemic would be something short. We all did, but anyway, when um, when the coronavirus was was going to be done, we could take on uh, climate change. But now, you know, we are really giving um, priority to climate change, to meteorological um, conditions, to really you know, protect ourselves in the best way as possible. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was really interesting, all this information that you provided and also this pilot program. I think it's something that's really great to take into consideration. And so we just want to, you know, reaffirm the importance of the data and the results that are coming out of this, and it really depends. I mean, the, the results depend on the quality of the data and the monitoring. And so it's really important to look at the connection and the importance of being able to make multidisciplinary um, investigations. So this is really important. And so especially when we look at, you know, being able to distribute this information, it's really important to be able so that communities are participating and that they have this information so they can see in um, what they can do about the situation that they are living in. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we are going to continue with um, the Q&A section. And so I'm gonna start with Dr. Patricia. Which we have several questions um, to um, be able to, to look into them. Okay. So, Patricia, could you come back? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Okay, great. We have several questions from our attendees. Yeah, go ahead. So, what is going on in the region that maybe there's a lack of um, in comprehensive governance? And um, how are those involved in these different factors? So we do an exercise that is called an evaluation of sectors, which is something that's done in all the different countries. It's called class. And that's when we analyze what is the management of the in the sector as such. And so here is where we find a lot of um, a wide range of things, There's a lot of fragmentation. And this is where um, we have to work more comprehensively with everybody who um, participates with the different, um, you know, the health sector with service providers and where, and when the health sector is not there, we need to really, um, you know, push ahead as to uh, the need to improve um, water and sanitation systems. And there is information, there's information, there's commitments um, at an international level, there's proposals, there's different accelerators, but we also start to make new analyses about water and sanitation and in this class process that so we want to see what are the different investments that are being made in this sector and so it's less than one percent of um, the 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 things that are invested in in water and sanitation and so if if that's the case how are we going to improve the situation and so these sort of um possibilities and spaces that are moving to improve these situations and to reveal what the actual situation is 
This helps to make it possible for us to make a change. And, and sometimes the um, emergency conditions become, you know, triggers. And so I remember that in my country, when um, CODER began, the environmental, um, you know, we really needed that more than technical staff. And so it made it possible to improve all of the capacity for specialists in all the different areas, to increase the number of inspectors. But we really need to have, you know, a strong healthcare sector to be able to make those um, changes in other sectors. The most effective sector of all of them, when we talk about investments and expenses, because for each expense and for each um, improvement in water systems, we have a reduction in um, costs and in healthcare. And so this would be one of the main um, managers and, 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 and parties that's giving leadership here. And so we really need to look at the evidence and see what is a health sector. I mean, how are we being affected? And how can we dream about having a better healthcare sector? It's a very clear response. Thank you very much. So the next question I have is, it's also a little bit related to what you said. Could you tell us what we could do to improve sanitation when we at the local, regional, and national uh, level? So sometimes we think about sanitation, and this is when we, we, we hear about this and we think about sanitation and um, treatment of wastewater that's happening in large cities. But there's other countries that have worked a lot with sanitation in households um, for populations that live in faraway um, areas. And so we look at that population to see if we can reach those communities with um, really a good uh, sanitary education that we're giving to the population. Sometimes we think about um, a massification of strategies, but we don't think about health and sanitation education. And so then I think about an experience that we had in where we put all of the um, sanitation, there was, a, there was a lot of infrastructure that was made and then people never used it because um, you, you had to really uh, train everybody so that they could really use the technology because it's not just technology, but we have to make sure that there's education, sanitation education, so that people actually use it. And here we're resolving a public health problem. And um, then we're talking about populations that live in faraway areas. And so here we're not leaving anybody behind because sometimes we think that, a, or we find that, that numbers really hide large inequalities. And so large scale numbers, and when we talk about averages or means, um, we have populations of people who do not have access to these services. So we've got to work with these people. And this is where we need to really um, do that work. All the community in this. Okay, a question here that I thought it was really interesting that was also mentioned in the presentation is um, right now we're looking at the different um, concerns about um, water access, but we didn't talk about um, wastewater and how those are being treated. So what do you think about the con and product products of consumption? And we can talk about this a little bit. What's the panorama that we have for the region? Why are some cities are not treating their water, they just um, throw them, they just, they just discharge them without treatment. Well, you know, let's look at how these, um, this used to be, we looked at sanitation previously. So sanitation was evaluated to see that we would have a sewer system or we would have, um, you know, latrines. But now when, if we focus on the entire um, presentation that has to do with water, but there is, you know, another viewpoint that we have um, with sanitation, where it was made to critical point, and we have the sanitation guidelines, and it's, we need to also think about technology and the different actions that happen at a local level when it comes to sanitation, and to see how investments are being made when an evaluation is made about the different investments between water and sanitation. The um, a certain amount of the population or the expenses are made in water. All of the expenses are invested in water and sanitation is what ends up not getting so many resources. 
And so if we don't have those resources, we can't make those changes to improve sanitation. So I need to improve and the sensibilities and the, the treatment of wastewater toward um, to have the, with the need of having that in our countries, because in the end, this is a cost that we're evaluating when it comes to healthcare, in our food, in um, having to be, you know, do deparasitation. So we need to deal with this entire chain. Um, and so it's something that we can't look at it, you know, just, just at, a, at a very minimal level. I mean, yeah, we look at water, but it's so important to look at sanitation because it's also a very critical point where we really need to accelerate these different components and to make sure that there's access to sanitation for the population and that that needs to be quality. And there's a whole ladder that we need to go, that we need to climb. And so we can, some people have sanitation, some have really bad sanitation. And then um, other ones that they, you know, just goes right into the river or it's just, you know, bad sanitation or it's just not treated at all. So there's, you know, there's really a ladder that we take and that's, that's evaluated. And what we need to do is just be really aware of these different indicators. Because we say, oh, okay, so we've got sanitation, but we've, we've got a sewer system and that's in our indicators. Well, no, we have sanitation, but we need to treat the water. And that's when we talk about safe sanitation. So you make the facilities, are they actually used by the population and is there separation? between the fact that like every household needs to have their own facilities and separation in the different healthcare um, areas, you know, for, for men, for women and for children. And so there was a school where they had one for, for children, for, for, for girls, for teachers, but in the end, the, the girls' bathroom ended up being for the teachers and they left one only for, for, for boys had latrines. And so the girls had no place to go to the bathroom. So these are components that are really important, that are very small, but they really do make change. It's clearly that's something that's very important. So when we talk here about specific cases or examples, there's questions here in the region. And so we can see if you're having, you know, serious problems in, in the drought in um, Pizikata Lake in um the, in Western Bolivia. And so you do have salt water in the San Jose region. So what measures can be taken um, in this situation? So here we need to be very specific about what is the quality of the um, different bridges that exist, the, you know, the different alternative um, bridges. And it's really important to do planning when you have an emergency, if the system exists, what kind of, um, what's the best um, source that I can have? in the region to be able to say, so this is the best source, this is the best option, or maybe I have other options and where I can get the water from, or maybe I could review other sources and, and, and dissolve, I don't know. You know, we have to really understand the actual issue and to find out what the different options we have that are available to say. This is, I mean, it's not just like a, like a, like a recipe that you can just say and you have to know exactly how to do it. You have to really look at the problem and see what kind of options you have available to you. So speaking of this, there's a very interesting question that we have here, which says that what are the different um, upcoming trends or challenges that are affecting um, potable water in the region? Well, I mean, uh, the, um, the, the, the up and coming um, risks that we see are the ones that we're finding. We have extreme droughts, we have floods, and that really changes the behavior of the surface sources, which are um, sources of water that changes the water quality. It also um, influences the treatment, water treatment um, options, the, the chemical treatments. I mean, all of these different effects are things that um, really need to be looked at ahead of time. You can't just, you know, we've got to be resilient. And so we've got to see what are the risks. And that's um, why we have all these plans that are being put together and where we can take different information to look like the information that's learned by El Salvador that's that they can really take all that information and make a risk analysis and and take risk um, and, and add um, control measures. You don't have those kind of connections or those links. You know, we've got you know some information here, other information there, but we need to analyze it all together to see how it can serve us so that we can make um, decisions. You know, the, the academia is very important here because they do research, they create um, technology and they update, they validate um, existing technologies. And so we really need to change, make a change within that, you know, the way our students are. Our students need to be agents of change 
for um, this feature that we have coming up. Bueno, y aquí quizá una, una, una más que pregunta, bueno, porque sí es una pregunta, pero sí. And I have another question. And maybe you can tell us about a, a specific examples about participatory monitoring processes regarding wood quality with the participation of communities and also designing indicators and variables. Maybe you can tell us about this uh, topic or you can tell us about some specific cases. Yes, there are very few cases. Um, I don't think this information has been systematized in the region. However, I remember we uh, did uh, have an experience with schools, aqua, aqua talks. And uh, teachers were uh, taught water quality parameters. For instance, if there were changes in color, if, if the water had chloride, they would go uh, to rivers to check the uh, water quality. It was a very simple and nice um, process. For instance, if lettuce would grow, if, um, I don't know, onion seeds would grow, etc. We would raise awareness regarding contamination among teachers and, and students. For instance, I don't know, teachers would tell us, oh, the water changed color in the sample. What's going on? And, and they said, for instance, they would talk to the boss or to the mayor. Um, the idea is to raise people's awareness, especially young people, and, you know, to take this, these small actions uh, so the population can do something about this. Um, this has been more of a pilot process. Um, we need to scale up this process, I think. Uh, we need to work with communities. For instance, in Mexico, they are uh, using water security plans and including them within uh, health uh, programs. And mayors actually uh, ask us what they can do with water, what they can do with solid waste as well, because these are the, the usual questions. And also, uh, uh, promotion agents can have an active role in this regard. Thank you so much. These examples are very interesting and they also show us that there's a lot to do in our region. Thank you very much for this information, Patricia. Salvador. Gracias. Salvador. First of all, Salvador, uh, congratulations. Uh, the, the participants are very happy with your presentation and the data you have shared with us. Now let us go on to the questions. If high uh, temperatures, or what is their connection between them and virus uh, born diseases? What we have studied so far in, the, in our country, in Chile, is that air temperature, especially low air temperature, does affect uh, respiratory, respiratory diseases. We do have seasonal outbreaks. For instance, this year there was a sharp increase in the syncytial respiratory virus. And this happens in uh, winter as well. Temperature clearly affects this, but it's not the only uh, variable. And there was another question that is also connected. Maybe the, this was a question you were going to ask, sorry, but it has to, it, it has to do with the question regarding social vulnerability and to what extent we can compare social vulnerability and climate. And we need to be very clear in this regard. There are some direct uh, effects uh, that will affect uh, people directly, for instance, floods, because they impact health directly. However, this flood also takes place in areas where there are vulnerable uh, populations. So vulnerability becomes the main factor and climate change and the impact of climate change will be, ex will be exacerbating gaps and problems. People's capacity to adapt to social and environmental disasters is different according to uh, each individual. 
and we need to consider that as well. Um, for instance, if cold weather increases the circulation of certain viruses, it will affect some specific populations that lacked the capacity to adapt. Yes, once again, we can say that vulnerability and adaptation um, are heterogeneous, heterogeneous and affect more vulnerable populations to a greater extent. So that's very important as well. Uh, regarding your uh, analysis, Salvador, clearly there are connections between the variables analyzed. How can this information help uh, overcome these health gaps when it comes to managing health risks? Well, that's a great question because so far, uh, this is a, a, an event in progress. We're analyzing the, the increase of uh, diseases, also Shigella, Salmonella, and temperature increases, etc. And how we need to analyze this impact and how this will take place in the future. If uh, public health policies are not adapted, then these impacts will increase in these specific sectors at time, as time goes by. Therefore, as the health sector, we should prioritize the sectors that are expected to suffer the most. In this way, we can prioritize and redirect our efforts in order to prevent these impacts on um, health. Thank you. The next question regarding the operations and uh, resilience regarding climate change. What type of experiences do we have available methodologies and which methodologies would we apply? Well, we're implementing different types of approaches. Uh, sometimes when we focus on methodology too much, we might not be able to um, answer some research questions. Lately, we have seen that engaging communities that provide information we've never had before to analyze the information through uh, traditional methodologies is useful. That's a current change. Right now, we're only using uh, applying statistical methodologies, we detect uh, significant differences. Um, so we should be able to uh, develop some public policies in the area of health, but we still have a long way to go. And this is a gap. We need to engage communities more effectively in order to have more feedback so that they can help us interpret the results we obtain to, to, to to know what is right or not. Um, OK, so we're talking about the tools now. How can we assess emergency plans or uh, disaster simulations in, when it comes to raising people's awareness? We are not assessing emergency plans. However, there are adaptation plans or climate change adaptation plans and uh, adaptation to other events. What we are trying to do is provide evidence uh, to feed these sector specific plans. Right now, we are not assessing this yet, but at least we are providing evidence. Although we already see the consequences of climate change and of El Nino this year in particular, because the effect was huge, but still we need to collect a lot of evidence and a lot of data. These are basic data. Our colleagues said just now uh, that sometimes data, global data conceal or hide uh, local realities. That's true. But also, uh, if you don't have the information, it, it's not real. Many times for public policies, we need data monitoring. We need to assess the harm. Otherwise, this harm is not created in order to develop a public policy to solve the issue. So sometimes it's good to start from the very small, as in, you know, um, assessing the, the event, the phenomenon. Yes, monitoring, exactly. Well, 
Finally, um, when it comes to tools, we implement multivariate uh, analysis to assess different types of pathogens and their interactions. Which type of software do you use for, the, for that statistical work? Software, okay, that's easier because we do work uh, using R. R is a tool which I think is very strong, first of all, because it's free. And you know, uh, that really helps Latin American countries. And number two, it uh, allows us to conduct different types of analysis, spatial, epidemiological, uh, database, uh, monitoring, charts, publications, etc. So I really like this software, R. And yes, we're conducting multivariate analysis. Uh, we studied several diseases. We implemented a pilot project that hasn't been published yet. But we're trying to include more complex aspects. We are now assessing, we were assessing or monitoring the climate at the beginning because it was a basic issue. But we know that these are multivariate issues. So we also need to include more variables in order to better interpret the data. That's very important as well. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Patricia, for your amazing presentation as well. You have all, both of us provided, uh, provided us with a lot of information. The examples have been truly illuminating. And now we know our current condition and how El Nino can make all this worse as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for the participants. Thank you for your questions. Um, the questions that haven't been answered will be answered later on, and you can have access to the questions in the link. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you for inviting us. Have a great day.